Welcome back, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Ramas uh, Budvari, Associate Research Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, his work spans cosmology, large scale structure, galaxy evolution. Uh, that's all the work I've just met him for the first time right now in person, but I've seen his work over the years a lot. Uh, and as we saw from Alex's talk, uh, his, a lot of his focus has been on the uh, statistical and computational challenges uh, in astronomy with these large data sets. Uh, this afternoon, he's going to be giving us a nice lecture on multiple object detections in time of surveys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the answers, having me here. Great to be here. Uh, Nice lecture, I don't know about that. This is a work in progress. This is a, a project that we are currently actively thinking about. Alex and I have been uh, confronted with a couple of challenges recently. Uh, these are actual problems that we face with uh, catalogs. And uh, so these are just thoughts arranged around the, the topic. OK. For those of you who are not astronomers, I have to start with this slide. Astronomy is beautiful. I always thought that we have to combine data so that we can look at the objects out there in different wavelengths and, and use all that multicolor information to, to learn more about the universe. Uh, but today, it's only there because it's beautiful. The real reason, of course, for combined data is today time domain astronomy. Lots of things happen in the sky, they go bang and then disappear, or just do ups and downs. And what we have is just snapshot of that. Lots of sequences of images. And we have to make the best of that data somehow. All right, so time series. How do you do that? How do you get a time series in the first place? So maybe it's a very basic question. But ideally, it's just wait for all the images to to, to be in your database or on disk, and then you co-add them. When you add them together, you figure out where all the sources are, and then, and then you can go back to any of the images and measure the flux here, the function of time. So that would be perfect, except you would have to wait for a long, long time to have all the images that you have. And it would be so much nicer to have something that's incremental, that's streaming, something that can, can go from image to image uh, without the need to store and go back to previous images. Okay. If, you have to, if you want to do that, you have to dig in the noise. And that, that makes things a little messy. And, uh, and that's my goal. See if we can find some sort of incremental strategy to weed out noise or find the real sources and uh, it's possible with from first principles. Again, we in progress. All right, so the outline is for today. Cross-matching catalogs, very briefly, I know several of you have heard me talking about cross-matching at length. Now I'll just sort of briefly summarize some of the, the key ingredients of the probability cross-matching because these are ingredients that can actually come handy, very useful for for looking at uh, the problem that I want to address today. And then I look at what's the probability of detecting something in single and multiple exposures. And then the third question, this is on to you. The question, are, are given observations, uh, do, do these observations correspond to real sources or not? Okay. Typically, it's a, good, it's a good idea to separate out several challenges. We face statistical, computational, and, and uh, national challenges every time we do something. What I'll talk about today mostly is going to be statistics. However, I'll point out some of the, some of the elements that we, we, uh, we have or in, in place or use to, to make these computations feasible and, and fast. But those I consider sort of separate problems, one at a time. First you solve the statistics problem, then you solve the computational problem, and then you, then you have science left, hopefully. All right. So first thing is cross-matching. 
the, the, key, the key to this problem turned out to be finding the right question. The right question is not how far things are on the sky, and so on and so on. The, the, real, the, the good question is, are, are the detections the same or not? So if you are given a bunch of measurements, and here I have data set on this sort of just direction on the sky, okay. these, are, these are locations of, of the direction that you have in hand. You can ask the question, are these measurements consistent with being the same object or not? And that you can ask in a Bayesian framework using hypothesis testing. The quantity that plays an important role here is the base factor, which is actually the likelihood ratio. It's a likelihood of a hypothesis that says, yes, they are the same, versus the other one that is the complementer, which says, no, any one of them could be coming from a different source. <laughs> okay, so how do I compute this, one of these things, is simply just parameterize the hypothesis and integrate over the entire parameter space. So, so the first one says they are all from the same object. If it's the same object, it has to have one true location on the sky. That's my parameter now. Okay. Then I can write up the integral that says this true position could be anywhere on the sky, that's my prior. And then the likelihood that says given the true, the true position, what are the possible observations and just put independent measurements. Okay, it's a single integral. And then, similar to the complementer, you actually have a set of locations, because any one of them could be going from the, from the different source, so a set of ni locations for the truth. And then the integral falls apart in a different way, and in fact, this is even easier to compute than the other one. Now, this is not as bad as it looks. If you plug in a normal distribution or a Fisher distribution, then actually it's a nice analytic formula. So all you have to do is work through the math and it's, it's Gaussian, essentially, spherical Gaussian, uh, Fisher distribution, spherical normal distribution. So it's all, all simple and analytic. Okay. Now that's not the end of the story. You want to get the probability, and how do you get that? For hypotheses that are complementary, complementary to each other, the simple rule that says, from the prior, I can use the posterior just using the base vector because uh, it's, a, it's a direct uh, consequence of base rule that you can apply to the most happens to do that sort of equation for the posterior probability. It, you know, this, is, this is essentially 1 minus PA is, is the, the complement there. But anyway, the, the problem is that we don't have a prior. And it turns out that it's not so much important because Large posteriors are fairly insensitive to small variations, so you can have a bit of guess that works. Or you can use some empirical based techniques and actually solve for it. So uh, that's, 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 the, that's, the trick. that's the key to it. So, so with that, we can actually do cross matching again, and we know what the statistics are. Okay. The computational component is well, let's do it on GPUs. Those are fast. You can run 25,000 threads on a single card. Let's use it. We have a new implementation that just uh, that we just released on GitHub, which is using a portable implementation in C++. The Boost library provides uh, threading so that the CPUs can drive the GPUs, and you can use as, as many GPUs you have in your system. We have tested this up to seven GPUs. That means seven times 25,000 threads running in parallel. It's a lot of threads. And uh, with that, we can cross my Sloan tree itself in three minutes. Okay. So these are, these are kind of stepping stones that we are building on to, to get up to the challenge that LSST and the new surveys present. Because we have to do this kind of cross matching all the time as data come in to, to, to find matching things and building up the time series. Okay. There's a shameless plug for a project that uh, we completed completed recently with Steve Google Space Telescope. Here we took the entire Hubble Legacy Archive and cross-meshed all the observations. The data itself is not humongous, it's about a terabyte. But some part of the sky covered hundreds of times or thousands. <coughs> that that it by itself represents a, quite a bit of computational challenge. And on top of that, 
the astrometry, astrometry, the accuracy of the positioning of the field is all over the place. So if you were to do some cross matching with that photometry, you would get this curve down here. Okay. So peak is at 20 milliard seconds. Huge. We have a very efficient and nice solver that runs inside a database that can correct for the estimate of each image that's involved in a cross match, groups of images overlapping, and that will give you a new peak, a new uh, histogram of hair that you will find in these, that is just essentially the absolute optimal that you could get without the accuracy of the image. So sometimes just a few milliseconds. So with that, we have reliable, reliable. Uh, now on the right hand side, you see is I'm serious, is how many matches we have with a given time span. Okay, so say you wanted to do time scale science with Hubble data, you could you could you would have up to uh, let's say 300 or 200 uh, days, you would have six seven thousand so like six seven hundred thousand matches to play with. If you want to go out to a thousand days, there's still two hundred thousand matches. A lot of data there could be exploited, and this is something that's going to be released real soon at the WAS. Okay, so that's that's the shameless plug. Now, okay, so what's real? As I said, it's a real problem in a sense that some of the catalogs that we see today are overwhelmed by junk. And we had seen it before, didn't know what to do with it. Now we have time series, so there's a chance to read these things out better than before. And, uh, and why it's important? Because, because there's money involved. If, if more than half of the data is junk, then you have to have twice as big databases built for them. And uh, so the idea is to, uh, to find an online method to prune these things as the data is collected as the survey goes on. Okay, so let's start with something simple. Imagine you have a real object with a given flux. We know how bright it is. It's it's true apparent flux in F. We measure it with an, with an uncertainty. So epsilon is and it comes from a galaxy and, and it has a sigma variation. That's a reasonably good model for astrometric measurements. So we have some, from Fi, which is the, the noise measurement, we can ask the question, what's the probability of a given object in the true flux F being observed? When your catalog is cut, there is a threshold that's, in, that's applied. The threshold, if that's Fd, essentially is the only point that enters the equation. We have the galaxy and into the data, here we get the error function. Is that simple? And what you get is curves like this. So you, you take two, three, four, five sigma, and you get see these green dotted lines. The sigma is going up. Well, the error function that is. Right? Um, now the red lines here are when you actually have a stack. Say you have nine images that you merge together. Essentially, what happens is the error shrinks, and then it gets a sharper. Okay. Now, if you have multiple exposures, then you can ask the question: Was the probability for a given flux f that I will see this source n times out of k exposures, like k observations? And this is what's shown with the red curves here. These nice curves going up and down is the one, two, three, four, five, and so on to nine uh, observations. It's just the third of the function of the flux. The flux here, as you can see, it goes from zero to seven in sigma units. That's uh, the blue curve here is the is the cumulant that, that, that when you add up, so it, it say it's n or more. Okay. So this is the probability that you see it once or more, two times or more, and so on. And um, what you can see here is that these curves actually look quite similar to what you would get with the stacks. 
And in fact, if you overput them on, on top of each other, and remember the yellow curve was, was essentially a nine-way stack and detection of that, and then the blue is essentially just doing a catalog-based co-ed in a way. The probability of seeing something is very similar, especially if you look at this second one, this is the three sigma curve, the three sigma threshold, very similar to the five detection out of nine. These are not, not that different, in fact, very similar. So there's hope where, where you can, you know, from here could conclude that, right, that, um, uh, not so. you could conclude that uh, you, you could do the same thing uh, with a catalog where very similar that you can do with an image. So how do we do it backwards? So in real life, we actually have you know, observations and non-detections. How do we combine those together? If like you just have a single exposure, then you have a single detection, say Fi, and then you can do the same type of calculus hypothesis testing we did before and compare real versus noise, where the real says, oh, I have a prior over the apparent flux, and then I have the likelihood for one detection of the Gaussian. So integral, the noise is easier because there's no flux there. Now, what's the prior on the apparent flux? Well, that's something actually estimates measure. So we measure the so-called number of counts. For example, the galaxy number of counts go as 1 over s squared, essentially. There's a problem with that. 1 over s squared goes to infinity if f equals 0. So uh, luckily, there is a solution to this, which is there is a threshold. Uh, for stars, you run out of stars. You have to keep the edge of the tail of this. For galaxies, it's essentially the oldest paradox, the dark, the dark night sky paradox. And, uh, and there, the combination with, uh, with, with going back in time as you farther and farther away, you run out of population of galaxies, and eventually you hit a limit, which, is, which, uh, which can be estimated from really deep observations. Okay, so, so with that, you can write the inverse problem, and you just have to make up the likelihood function for your uh, multiple detection. And if you have a component that has the bionic distribution, and it has the, the component that is, uh, that is the fluxes. Okay. Right. So noise is different, and I didn't think it would be that complicated. The noise is a, a continuous Gaussian random field. And over that, when you look for local maxima, you it can actually generate a point process and things are complicated. But luckily, this is something that can be computed. In fact, it has, has been done. One of us has done it at least. And 30 years ago, there was a famous BBKS paper, uh, which essentially did the same type of calculations in 3D, which is harder. So there's hope that one can do this. It hasn't been done, we haven't done it yet, however, we have done some hand waving arguments about geometry and sizes, how big the PSF is, the blur, and so on, that, that, that mixes the different pixels. And, um, and this is just sort of first results looking at LSST image simulations. This is actually a, a simulation of an image simulation. So it's not real data, but, <laughs> but what you have here is essentially uh, realistic things. And, and here in the corner are seeing the noise values. On the right hand side, you have a function of magnitude of flux. The, the real source is a thousand, a thousand sources here, and the noise comes down the, in the objects. And as you can see, there is a really nice intuitive result. The number of times, this field has number of times you see it, it is, is, is very important. And then the flux, the blur, is introduced by the, the flux measurement. Now, this is, of course, different every time you have different thresholds, so this can shrink if the threshold is different, uh, also the blur can be different. So, so this is something that is currently being studied, and, and we don't have conclusions yet. So with this, you know, we can hope that giving a survey, you can you know, maintain real objects, junk objects, and somewhere to, to keep track of them for future reference, and you can prune as you go. So that's what I wanted to say. Now, with that, you can hope to have an assuming implementation. And with a pipeline that will essentially work at independent catalogs of the images and combine them optimally. And this could be, you know, in general, expanded, extended to have models that very variable stars. And, you know, 
So there's lots of things to be done, but is that just one of the first steps? And and uh, that's where I stop. Thank you. Questions, sir? I was about to ask you about the last challenge extension to variable sources. What if you have intermittent source that only occasionally peaks some significant, but enough times that it all together in principle with the variable source? If you know which conservation source. That's a very good question. I mean, I would hope that you know if it if it does it all the time, it's truly periodic and it will come back. You no, know, it just happens once, a few it's times. Time, right? Let's think about it. The coffee break <laughs> over coffee. <laughs> You mentioned about having a stack of images where you can then predict how many times something will be seen. But suppose you knew the possible nature of an object likely to be lurking there, then how do you do those models seen then? Is something of that kind going into your thing? If you... If you do, uh, if I tell you that at this pixel I expect this particular kind of object, say a C, which I know should vary in such and such fashion, then does the computation change? Right, so if you have if you have time time information, if you have the epochs which you do, uh, then then you can of course uh, essentially vary your ground truth as you do the integrals in your in that kind of plot. So your reference plots will be time dependent, but you will just have essentially a parameter that any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah,